11 sepsis warning signs you're ignoring right now. Doctors urge you to know. Every two minutes, someone dies from sepsis. And here's the terrifying part. Most of them had warning signs days before that looked like nothing more than a common cold or a mild fever. What if the symptoms you're brushing off right now aren't what you think they are? Sepsis kills more people than heart attacks and strokes combined. It's the body's deadly overreaction to an infection, and it can turn fatal in just hours. According to the CDC, at least 1.7 million adults develop sepsis every year in the United States alone, and nearly 350,000 of them don't survive. Yet studies show that one in three adults have never even heard of it, and the ones who have often can't name a single symptom. Now here's why this matters to you specifically. Research from the Global Sepsis Alliance reveals that up to 80% of sepsis deaths could be prevented with early recognition. That means survival often comes down to one thing, knowing what to look for before it's too late. The 11 warning signs coming up in this video are the exact symptoms medical professionals say are most commonly dismissed or ignored. Note, this video is for educational purposes only and not a substitute for professional medical advice. Always consult a qualified healthcare provider about your health. All information shared is backed by credible peer-reviewed research, with links to the original studies in the description. Sign number one, altered mental status. Sepsis attacks the brain in ways most people never expect. When infection spreads through your bloodstream, it can trigger a condition called sepsis-associated encephalopathy, abbreviated as SAE. This medical term describes brain dysfunction caused directly by the body's overwhelming response to infection. A comprehensive review published in the journal Diagnostics in 2025 revealed alarming statistics about this symptom. The prevalence of sepsis-associated encephalopathy ranges from 39% to 68% of all sepsis patients. Patients exhibiting altered mental status face a mortality rate of 49% compared to just 26% in those without neurological symptoms. The underlying mechanism involves your blood-brain barrier breaking down under inflammatory assault. Inflammatory molecules called interleukins and tumor necrosis factor alpha flood into brain tissue. These substances increase permeability of the protective barrier that normally shields your brain from harmful substances. Clinical scoring systems recognize this warning sign as critically important for early detection. The NEWS2 scoring system assigns a score of 3 when new confusion appears. This score alone triggers an urgent clinical review protocol in hospitals worldwide. The QSOFA score, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2016, includes altered mentation as one of three essential criteria. Confusion that appears suddenly in someone fighting an infection demands immediate medical evaluation. Sign number two, tachycardia. Your heart racing during an infection signals more than simple stress or fever response. Tachycardia, the medical term for elevated heart rate, represents one of the earliest physiological changes during sepsis development. This elevated rate reflects your cardiovascular system struggling to maintain adequate blood flow. Research published in the Annual Update in Intensive Care and Emergency Medicine in 2015 explained why persistent tachycardia proves so dangerous. The rapid heart rate in septic shock is not merely compensatory adaptation. Instead, it represents maladaptive sympathetic nervous system overstimulation and early damage to heart muscle function. A groundbreaking randomized controlled trial demonstrated the mortality implications of uncontrolled heart rate. Researchers administered Esmolol, a beta blocker medication, to reduce heart rates below 95 beats per minute. Patients receiving this treatment experienced 28-day mortality rates of 49.4% compared to 80.5% in control groups. Further evidence from clinical infectious diseases in 2021 confirmed these findings in a large cohort study. Absolute tachycardia, defined as heart rate at or above 100 beats per minute, independently predicted 30-day mortality. The statistical odds ratio for death with absolute tachycardia reached 1.66, meaning significantly higher death risk. Patients with high tachycardia index who received beta blocker medications showed 50% lower likelihood of dying within 30 days. These medications work by blocking adrenaline receptors in the heart. This evidence supports monitoring heart rate as an essential component of sepsis screening protocols used in emergency departments. Sign number three, hypothermia. Body temperature abnormalities during sepsis appear at both extremes of the thermometer. Your immune system typically generates fever to fight infection by creating an inhospitable environment for pathogens. However, some patients develop hypothermia, meaning dangerously low body temperature below normal ranges. 
A landmark analysis published in Critical Care in 2021 examined 6,542 patients with severe sepsis. Researchers discovered a bimodal distribution pattern of body temperatures. Peaks occurred at hypothermia below 35.5 degrees Celsius and fever above 38 degrees Celsius, while normal temperature readings were surprisingly rare. Hypothermia carried significantly worse outcomes than fever in this patient population. The 28-day mortality rate reached 45.7% for hypothermic patients compared to 27.1% for those with high fever. Both temperature extremes correlated with elevated lactate levels, indicating inadequate oxygen delivery to tissues. A systematic review in Frontiers in Medicine in 2023 identified four distinct temperature trajectory patterns in sepsis patients. Hypothermia occurred more frequently in older patients and consistently predicted poor outcomes. Researchers theorized that fever indicates stronger immune resistance to infection. Conversely, hypothermia reflects a hypometabolic state where the body shifts towards tolerance rather than active pathogen elimination. Community-acquired sepsis, advanced age, lower body mass index, and colder environmental temperatures all predicted hypothermic responses. Recognizing both fever and unusual coldness as warning signs improves early sepsis detection rates significantly. Sign number four, tachypnea. Breathing faster than normal often represents your body's earliest response to spreading infection. Tachypnea, the medical term for rapid breathing, occurs when respiratory rate exceeds normal ranges of 12 to 20 breaths per minute. This symptom frequently appears before other more obvious sepsis signs develop. A comprehensive review in the journal Infection in 2021 classified tachypnea among essential red flag signs for sepsis identification. In pediatric cases of meningococcal disease, rapid breathing appeared up to eight hours before full clinical presentation. This substantial lead time creates opportunities for life-saving early intervention. The Journal of Clinical Medicine in 2023 connected tachypnea to another serious complication called sepsis-associated delirium. Patients with increased respiratory rates showed higher likelihood of developing this brain dysfunction. Rapid breathing often indicates underlying hypoxia, meaning insufficient oxygen reaching vital organs. Metabolic acidosis also drives tachypnea during sepsis progression. Your body produces excess acid when cells cannot obtain adequate oxygen for normal energy production. The lungs compensate by expelling more carbon dioxide through faster breathing to restore blood chemistry balance. The Q-SOFA score includes respiratory rate at or above 22 breaths per minute as one of three diagnostic criteria. Combining the sign with altered mental status and low blood pressure creates a powerful screening tool. Sign number five, hypotension. Blood pressure dropping during infection represents a dangerous transition towards septic shock. Hypotension occurs when systolic blood pressure falls below safe thresholds, impairing blood flow to vital organs. This cardiovascular collapse reflects your blood vessels losing their ability to maintain adequate tension. The New England Journal of Medicine published the CLOVERS trial in 2023, defining specific blood pressure thresholds for sepsis identification. Researchers enrolled patients presenting with systolic blood pressure below 100 millimeters of mercury. They also included those with mean arterial pressure below 65 millimeters of mercury after receiving initial fluid resuscitation. Mean arterial pressure represents a calculated average pressure during the complete cardiac cycle. This measurement incorporates both systolic pressure during heart contraction and diastolic pressure during relaxation. Maintaining adequate mean arterial pressure proves essential for organ perfusion. A meta-analysis in intensive care research in 2023 quantified kidney injury risk associated with sustained hypotension. Mean arterial pressure below 65 millimeters of mercury carried an odds ratio of 2.25 for developing sepsis-associated acute kidney injury. This means significantly more than double the risk compared to patients maintaining normal pressures. Continuous hypotension causes severe reduction in blood flow reaching kidney tissues. Renal tubular cells begin dying from oxygen deprivation, a process called tubular necrosis. Early detection and aggressive correction of low blood pressure prevents cascading organ failures that dramatically increase mortality risk in septic patients. Sign number six, oligorrhea. Urine output provides a real-time window into kidney function during sepsis progression. Oligorrhea describes abnormally low urine production typically defined as less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram of body weight per hour. This measurement reveals whether kidneys receive adequate blood flow to perform their filtering functions. A multi-center retrospective study published in Frontiers in Medicine in 2024 analyzed 7,218 intensive care unit patients with sepsis. Researchers discovered a significant negative correlation between 24-hour urine volume and 28-day mortality. Each 50 milliliter increase in daily urine volume corresponded with 1% reduction in death risk. Patients producing less than 50 milliliters of urine over 24 hours faced dramatically elevated mortality. Their statistical odds ratio reached 2.63, 
indicating substantially higher death risk than patients with better kidney function. This finding established 24-hour urine volume as a powerful prognostic indicator. The Journal of Clinical Medicine in 2025 refined understanding of oliguria timing in sepsis-associated acute kidney injury. Researchers found that shorter episodes of reduced output, lasting just three to six hours, accurately predicted critical outcomes. Oliguria often appears before standard blood tests reveal elevated creatinine levels. Creatinine is a waste product normally filtered by kidneys and measured through blood tests. Waiting for creatinine elevation delays recognition of kidney dysfunction by hours or even days. Monitoring urine output provides earlier warning, creating opportunities for interventions that may preserve kidney function. Sign number seven, elevated lactate levels. Lactate accumulating in your blood tells physicians that tissues are starving for oxygen. This biochemical marker rises when cells switch from oxygen-dependent energy production to less efficient anaerobic metabolism. Elevated lactate levels indicate tissue hypoperfusion, meaning inadequate blood flow delivering oxygen to organs. Critical Care published research in 2021 demonstrating lactate patterns across sepsis temperature phenotypes. Both hypothermic and highly febrile kitchens showed elevated lactate levels. This association with temperature extremes confirmed lactate as a marker of disease severity, regardless of thermal response type. A systematic review in Vascular and Endovascular Review in 2025 examined how lactate dynamics predict patient outcomes. Initial lactate levels at hospital presentation carry prognostic value for mortality risk assessment. However, researchers discovered that tracking lactate changes over time provides even stronger predictive information. Early lactate clearance describes the reduction of lactate concentration within hours of beginning treatment. Patients who failed to clear lactate within 6 to 12 hours of resuscitation face significantly higher mortality rates. This finding transformed clinical practice regarding serial lactate levonatering. Modern sepsis treatment protocols now incorporate repeated lactate measurements throughout resuscitation. Physicians use these trends to assess whether interventions successfully restore tissue oxygenation. Sign number 8. Skin changes. Your skin provides visible evidence of circulatory problems developing during sepsis. Mottling describes patchy discoloration with irregular purple or reddish areas, typically appearing first around knees and elbows. This marbled appearance results from microvascular dysfunction affecting the smallest blood vessels. A comprehensive review in the journal Infection in 2021 emphasized that skin changes may precede classic sepsis symptoms by several hours. Variations in extremity temperature, particularly cool hands and feet despite warm core temperature, signal early cardiovascular compromise. These physical examination findings require no laboratory testing for immediate recognition. Motling scoring systems quantify the extent of skin discoloration for prognostic assessment. Higher motling scores correlate directly with increased mortality risk in septic patients. A motling score of 4 or 5 indicates severe microcirculatory failure with corresponding survival implications. The BMJ published updated NICE guidance in 2024, highlighting additional concerning skin findings. Motled or ashen appearance demands immediate attention regardless of other vital sign abnormalities. Cyanosis, the bluish discoloration from oxygen-poor blood, similarly indicates severe circulatory compromise. Petechiae and purpura represent another category of concerning skin changes. These non-blanching spots result from small hemorrhages beneath the skin surface. Pressing glass against these lesions distinguishes them from blanching rashes, as hemorrhagic spots maintain their color under pressure. Sign number 9. Non-blanching rash and petechiae. A rash that does not disappear when pressed represents a medical emergency requiring immediate evaluation. Petechiae are small pinpoint hemorrhages appearing as red or purple dots scattered across the skin. Purpura describes larger areas of bleeding under the skin, sometimes merging into extensive patches. A European multicenter study published in Acta Pediatrica in 2023 investigated children presenting with fever and petechial rash. The combination of these findings dramatically increased likelihood of serious bacterial infection. Children with petechial rash were 8.5 times more likely to have sepsis or meningitis. Meningococcemia represents the most feared diagnosis associated with petechial rash and fever. This bloodstream infection with Neisseria meningitidis bacteria progresses rapidly towards septic shock. Children with this presentation required life-saving interventions and intensive care unit admission at significantly higher rates. The glass test provides a simple screening method for non-blanching rashes at home. Press a clear drinking glass firmly against the rash and observe whether spots fade or remain visible. Spots that persist under pressure indicate bleeding rather than simple inflammation. Disseminated intervascular coagulation, abbreviated DIC, often underlies extensive petechial and purpuric rashes. This coagulation disorder consumes clotting factors while simultaneously causing abnormal clotting and bleeding. Recognition of non-blanching rash as a sepsis warning sign enables faster treatment initiation. Sign number 10. Elevated inflammatory markers and blood ratios.
Laboratory tests reveal inflammatory responses that physical examination cannot detect. The neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, called NLR, divides the count of neutrophils by lymphocyte count from a standard blood test. Elevated ratios indicate systemic inflammation and predict worse outcomes in sepsis patients. Intensive Care Research published a comprehensive review in 2025 examining whole blood cell-derived inflammatory markers. Beyond NLR, researchers analyzed platelet-to-lymphocyte ratio, monocyte-to-lymphocyte ratio, and systemic immune inflammation index. Higher values for these calculated markers correlated consistently with poor sepsis outcomes. Dynamic monitoring of inflammatory markers throughout hospital stays provides crucial prognostic information. Initial values at admission establish baseline inflammatory status. Subsequent measurements reveal whether treatments effectively reduce inflammation or whether clinical deterioration continues. Procalcitonin represents another important laboratory marker for sepsis detection. A meta-analysis in BMC Emergency Medicine in 2025 found procalcitonin sensitivity of 78% and specificity of 77% for sepsis diagnosis. This protein rises specifically during bacterial infections, helping distinguish bacterial from viral causes. Presepsin, a newer biomarker, demonstrated even better performance in some studies. Sensitivity reached 82% with 78% specificity for sepsis detection in emergency department settings. These laboratory markers complement clinical assessment, providing objective evidence supporting or refuting sepsis diagnosis. Sign number 11. Respiratory failure. Oxygen levels dropping in your blood indicate respiratory system failure during sepsis progression. Hypoxia describes insufficient oxygen reaching tissues, while SpO2 measures oxygen saturation in arterial blood using pulse oximetry. Normal SpO2 ranges from 95 to 100%, with values below 94% indicating concerning hypoxemia. Critical Care Medicine published research in 2021 linking hypoxia to pneumonia and acute respiratory distress syndrome in sepsis. ARDS represents severe lung injury, where fluid accumulates in air sacs, blocking oxygen transfer. This complication develops in a significant percentage of sepsis patients and carries high mortality. The CLOVERS trial tracked respiratory outcomes across different fluid resuscitation strategies. New invasive mechanical ventilation occurred in 11% of restrictively managed patients and 12.7% of liberally managed patients. These rates demonstrate how frequently sepsis progresses to requiring breathing machine support. Frontiers in Medicine published a scoping review in 2023 examining oxygen therapy strategies in critically ill patients. Liberal oxygen administration, attempting to achieve higher than normal saturation levels, actually increased mortality risk. Excessive oxygen may worsen inflammatory responses and contribute to organ dysfunction. Recognizing early hypoxia enables timely respiratory support before complete failure occurs. Patients may initially compensate through increased breathing effort without appearing obviously distressed. Continuous pulse oximetry monitoring catches desaturation trends before patients develop visible respiratory distress requiring emergency intubation.